Who here has been poked in the eye by their mask? <laughs> Is that just me? Okay, all right. Good morning. Is there any place you'd rather be than at worship this morning? Amen. Amen. Let's talk about the stuff going on. Well, no, first got to talk about uh, sports reports. Um, let's see. West Delaware, varsity took second. JV took first in the cross-country meet this, this last week. Amen. Um, let's see. Nebraska's still undefeated. Uh, the Big Ten is going to start football around Halloween, right? It's October 24th, right? I should know that date for some reason. Why should I know that date? Oh, that's right. It's my anniversary. Um, but more importantly, we're going to be playing football. Um, I just want to point out that um, uh, they, they've announced our first four games, and all four of our first four games are against teams against uh, preseason top 20. But I'm encouraged because there's football. Um, anyway, uh, am I missing anything? No, all right, well, let's move on. Disaster relief, uh, chainsaw teams, we'll be going out on Wednesday. Um, uh, I, I don't know how long this has been going, going to continue, but I'm going to imagine probably until it gets too cold. Um, I don't think it's going to be done yet. Uh, we will be leaving here at 8. We'll be back by 5. Pack your own lunch. Uh, we'll have water uh, provided. If you like throwing chainsaws and you have a chainsaw, um, that's great. We'd love to have you. Um, but we really need people to pull limbs. That would be wonderful. Um, November marks the 10th anniversary of Operation Christmas Child as a drop-off location. I'm going to look at Stephanie. Would you like to speak to that? Will you email me? Sure. Please do. So my name is Stephanie Stocks, if you don't know me. Um, and like Pastor Phil said, this will be our 10th anniversary as an Operation Christmas drop-off location. And so we've set some high goals for what we are hoping to do this year. We are um, set our goal for our church to pack 1,010 shoe boxes. And donations have been coming in. And instead of having our regular packing party where we pack you know, hundreds and hundreds to 1,000 boxes in one morning, we're going to spread that out um, People have been working, our volunteers have already been working and preparing those supplies. And starting, I'm hoping in about two weeks, I would like people to maybe stick around after our church services, like three or four people each week to start packing those boxes so we can just do it as a slow process instead of a mad dash one morning. So look for information to be coming out about signups to do that. You know, if you stayed even for 15 or 30 minutes after church service, we can get lots of boxes packed in that short amount of time. So be looking for some information about that. There are also shoe boxes out on the welcome desk in the narthex, so you can start taking empty boxes home to start filling yourself. So if you have any questions about OCC, please let me know. Um, if I pick up a box, is there a paper there telling me what goes in it? There is a pamphlet out there as well, and if you have questions about what else needs to go in or what can't go in, go to the website, or again, you can contact me. Thank you. It's a wonderful ministry that we are just very, very blessed to be a part of, and I appreciate all the hard, hard work that goes into it. Um, we'll be down in the uh, old youth room for the packing, so there's plenty of space to spread out. Masks will be required during the packing. Um, I'm just going to touch on masks for a moment. Um, I've been hearing a lot of, because some churches have gone back and they have what's called mask optional, okay? And, and that sounds great. really does. I don't have a problem with that. Only for us to go to mask optional now doesn't seem to make sense when we're higher now than we've ever been in current cases. And I just received a text message. I don't, uh, I, I haven't heard it on the news, but I heard it from somebody who has family in Good Neighbor Home. The Good Neighbor Home currently has 11 positive cases. Can anybody confirm that? Because I don't know who they are. I, I don't know anything about it. But um, y'all, we're not through this yet. That's just, the, that's just the way it is. So masks are gonna continue to be required. Um, the clothing closet will be open on Monday mornings from 8 to 12. Masks are required. No children or donations at this time, except they are now accepting winter donations only. So winter clothes and jackets, of course, are always needed. Um, and I believe that's all I have this morning. Y'all, let us sit back. Let us rest in God's word. Let's make our hearts and minds right with God. And let us draw near this morning.
Let us pray together. May God, who seeth all things, and who is the ruler of all spirits, and the Lord of all flesh, who chose our Lord Jesus Christ and us through him to be a peculiar people, grant to every soul that calleth upon his glorious and holy name faith, peace, patience, long suffering, self control, purity, and sobriety to the well pleasing of his name through our high priest and protector, Jesus Christ, by whom be to him glory and majesty and power and honor, both now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We beseech you, Master, to be our helper and protector. Save the afflicted among us. Have mercy on the lowly. Raise up the fallen. Appear to the needy. Heal the ungodly. Restore the wanderers of your people. Feed the hungry. Ransom our prisoners. Raise up the sick. Comfort the faint-hearted. The peace of Christ be with you. As we have received grace and love in Jesus Christ, let us share Christ's peace with one another. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Psalm 91, verses 9 through 16. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I love walk-up music. It's so great. (laughs) Takes me back to the days when I could still be athletic and play baseball. You know, you're coming up to the plate and you get this awesome song going. It's like, all right, I'm in the groove. I'm ready to roll. So thank you, Beth. All right. So we've been talking about prayer 
for a couple weeks, and I think we're going to talk about prayer some more today. That would be my guess. Um, today's scripture comes from Mark chapter 9, and it's pretty cool. So to start things out, Jesus and a few of the disciples are up on the Mount of, this is a tough word, so be ready for it, the Mount of Transfiguration. Got that out. That's a lot of syllables. So they're up there. They're praying. They're doing their thing. The other nine disciples are down at the bottom of the mountain. And this guy shows up and he's with his son. And he's like, "Uh, I know you guys follow Jesus. My son is super sick. He's plagued by this demon. He all of a sudden will go into violent convulsions, flop around on the fish, and basically not be able to function and he's like can you guys please help my son and they're like okay yeah we'll see what we can do and they're trying to get this demon out of this boy and it doesn't work it's not working at all and all of a sudden people are like noticing this commotion and the teachers of the law show up and they're like ha ha look at these jesus freaks it's not working Jesus isn't right because they want to have the power for themselves. They want to be the ones in charge. And Jesus and the three other disciples up on the mountain, they get done praying up there and they come back down. And they're all like, look, Jesus, your little deal isn't working here. And Jesus walks over to the boy and says to the demon to come out. And the demon is like, freaking out. He comes out of this kid. The kid's screaming. or The demon's screaming. The kid falls over and everybody's like, Jesus just killed this dude. And uh, Jesus grabs the boy by the hand, picks him up all as well. And the, Jesus goes to the father and says, why do you ask me to do this? Do you believe? And he says, I do believe. Help me overcome my disbelief. Which is kind of, that really struck me in this scripture because how many of us go through doubts in our faith? It happens all the time, right? And this guy, even though he was so helpless and he did believe but had doubts in his faith, still trusted Jesus. So the end of the story comes about and the disciples are like, Jesus, that was awesome. That was really cool. But why could we not cast out this demon. And Jesus says, because this demon, here's the quote in the scripture, says, this kind can only come out by prayer. So as Pastor Phil gets up here in a couple minutes, um, he's going to tell us a little bit more in depth about this story. But um, even though we have doubts in our faith sometimes, as long as we keep that trust in God, he will lead us the right way. So if you bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, um, It's hard to be faithful 100% of the time. We have so many distractions, so many things pulling at us. But help us to be like this Father. Keep our faith and let us always remember that even if we struggle, we can always come to you in prayer to restore that faith. We love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't get no stinking walk-up music. <laughs> All right. As Zach pointed out, thank you, Zach. That was great. Um, we are talking about Mark chapter 9, beginning of verse 14 today. Hear now the word of God. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. Man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him and throws him to the ground, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. Ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. 
So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the, the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity. Take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Holy and loving God, we thank you for this morning and this time for us to be here in this place in worship. And Lord, we come seeking here this day peace and rest and grace. We come seeking to be filled with your spirit Lord, we come seeking you for questions that we know not the answers. Lord, meet us here in our place of doubt. Meet us here in our place of unbelief. Lord, meet us here and draw us ever nearer to you. Help us to see you for all that you are. Lord, help us to love you even more. And as I lead in this time, I ask you, please allow me to diminish so that you're revealed all the more. Lord, we love you. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so Jesus takes his inner, inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and they go up to this mountain to a quiet place to pray. And while he was there, he is transfigured in their sight. And there upon the mountain, Jesus is joined by Moses, who's representing God's law, and Elijah representing God's prophecy. And they spoke of the things to come while they all glowed so, they, they, they shone with such white that it was like looking into a flash of lightning. Then they all heard this voice of God proclaim, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Then Peter tells Jesus, it's good that we're here. Let's build three shelters, one for you and one for Elijah and one for Moses. And let's just stay here. Let's just stay here and rest in God's presence. And, and, and let us remain here in worship where it's safe and everything makes sense. But Jesus said, no, we cannot remain here on this mountaintop, in this mountaintop experience. We are needed to proclaim the gospel in the valley below. When Jesus entered the town, the people were in awe and they came near to him. What was it about Jesus? Just walking into town, everyone looked up and they, they were filled with wonder and they wanted to draw near. Well, Jesus had just returned from the mountain where he had a close encounter with God and with Moses and Elijah. Remember when Moses returned from the mountain carrying the tablets upon which God carried the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant of law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Though scripture does not give us detail, there was something special about Jesus in this moment that overwhelmed them with wonder and they came closer to Jesus to get a better look. So as they come into the valley town, they find that the other disciples are in a conflict with religious leaders in the midst of the growing crowd. And this is where our scripture begins today, as the other nine were fighting with the, with the scribes. See, a father has brought his son before the disciples for help as the child is demon-possessed, but the disciples could not heal the boy. Drive the demon from the boy. I'm sure Peter is thinking this is why we should have stayed on the mountain. 
The scribes are the teachers of religion and are trained in rhetoric, and they would have been gifted in arguing their point. And I'm sure they are mocking and embarrassing the other disciples. Who do these men of common birth think they are? How dare they challenge our authority? What is the message of repentance? What is this message of repentance and grace? To assume that the... Um, yeah, what, who's this message of repentance and grace? Because they felt that was their authority to say. Theologian Graham Cole, from the context, it's reasonable to assume that the scribes criticized the disciples for their inability to help the demon-possessed boy. One wonders why these same scribes, scribes, instead of further embarrassing the crestfallen disciples before the crowd, did not set about exercising the demon themselves as proof of orthodoxy, which means right teaching. But everyone knows that you cannot dispossess a mute spirit. In their culture at the time, the only way that you can have power over a demon is to know the demon's name. And how can you know the name of a demon who will not speak? The father describes the son's ailment as possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. When we look at this through our 21st century eyes, we conclude this is not a demon, but that this is a child with an illness something like epilepsy. But pay close attention to what Jesus does. Jesus heals the sick, but he also drives out demons. He is God incarnate. Jesus knows the difference between illness and demon possession. Jesus does not heal this child. Jesus drives out the demon from this child. Theologian Archibald Thomas Robertson writes, Jesus addresses the demon as a separate being from the boy, as he often does. This makes it difficult to believe that Jesus was merely indulging a popular belief in superstition. He evidently regards the demon as the cause, in this case, of the boy's misfortune. I will tell you that I have thought otherwise for many years until I really studied the scripture in preparation for today. And I know that my mind has been changed. This, this is not a story um, where they didn't understand what was happening. They just didn't have the right diagnosis. Jesus did not heal this child. He worked as a, as a demon possession. There's no question that there's a separation between the two, and Jesus knows the difference. And it caused me to think about it. Is there still spiritual warfare in our world today? And if so, who's winning? And I think about the year 2020 thus far and it seems like the good the good guys might be behind in the in the score but you know what it's a rerun we actually know how this game ends i would rather this game wouldn't it life be easier if in this game we always were victorious victorious wouldn't it be great if this was a blowout? Wouldn't this be great if this was, was a hundred to nothing type of game? But our human condition does not allow for that, and evil will have its victories. But I promise you, we know that God wins in the end. Jesus said, you unbelieving generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Is Jesus speaking to his disciples? Is Jesus speaking to the scribes? Is Jesus speaking to the assembled crowd? I submit to you that Jesus is speaking to all of them. In fact, Jesus is speaking to all of us, and I mean every single one of us. I believe there are two things that Jesus is referring to with this comment. The first is the scribes engage in rhetoric in an effort to shame another to further their self-importance. The, the disciples respond in trying to defend themselves to maintain their dignity. And all the while, there is a boy who is ill, who, who is demon-possessed, who is no longer the priority but the subject that they are talking about. 
Does that make sense? How many times do we talk about a problem without seeking a solution that we are personally invested in to be the catalyst to see the change necessary take place? You understand what I'm saying? We're really good at talking about problems. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but how many of us have Facebook accounts? Okay. Boy, oh boy, if you want an opinion, just sign on, right? And these opinions, they go from some that I might agree with to some that horrify me to some that just flat scare me. And, and, and everybody's got an opinion and they're all willing to, to spout it, you know, on, on, on public media or, uh, because, you know, that's going to incite change. But the problem here is, is that no place does it seem to go from there to where rubber hits the road. People, we live in a, in a, in a time that requires change. We live in a, in a culture that requires change. We, we, we have civil unrest. We have uh, accusations one way going another. And, and, and our, our hearts and our world are troubled. And we need change. And we need to have the kind of discussion that doesn't look for a winner. My idea and my opinion is better than yours because that's not getting us anywhere if we haven't noticed. We need a discussion that says, how do we bring peace into our world? How do we bring caring back into our culture? And then do it. Be the catalyst of that change. Be the one that stands up and says, enough is enough. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to you. I instead am going to be the one that says, this is the way it ought to be. Hold our ground. And you know what? It might be socially risky, perhaps. But are we not called to stand apart? They stood and argued over the, this boy who is in dire trouble. And they sat and argued about who had the right opinion. And I don't care about the opinion. I care about right action. And that's what Jesus reveals. I do not believe in this prayer. How long shall I stay with you? I do not believe that Jesus is considering giving up on humanity and walking away from the burden of the cross. But I do believe Jesus in his humanity, after leaving a mountaintop faith experience, walks in the midst of this story and prays to God in his frustration. Perhaps this, this, this prayer is something akin to, Lord, give me strength. They just don't seem to hear me. Then Jesus asked to see the boy to again make the act of mercy a greater priority than just talking about it. As soon as the demon sees the, it comes face to face with God incarnate, it throws the boy into convulsions. The demon knew that its time was up, so it began to do as much harm as possible to this child before it was going to be forced to leave. The demon was not going to let go of his possession easily. How hard evil works to hold on to us in our false narratives and our false beliefs. Jesus inquires, how long has this boy suffered this way? Since childhood, the father says. It's fair to assume it's been many years that this demon has tried to hurt or kill this child. Then the father of the possessed child says, but if you can do anything, if you can... Jesus is acknowledging in the moment that the Father's faith is now not a faith of assurance, but a faith of possibility. If you can, do you have enough power? Do you have the authority? Right now, Jesus is a possible solution, a possible way, a possible Messiah. Not in the assurance that Jesus is the solution, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus proclaims everything's possible for one who believes. I believe that Jesus is Lord, so all things are possible. But all things are not guaranteed. 
What if my desires are not godly desires? Jesus proclaiming his authority, but also his priorities, and they not, might not match our own. Lord, <coughs> I need victory in my narrative so that everybody can see that I was the most right. I'm the smartest. I'm, I'm, I'm the best. But what if my way is not God's way? What if the glory does not belong with me, but it is truly God who needs to be glorified so that others will know and believe? When we trust God is true and all of his promises are true, then all things he promises are possible. Theologian Charles Spurgeon writes, but we have to believe God is true. If all the angels in heaven were to march by me in a file and assure me that God would keep his word, I should say I did not require you to tell me that, for the Lord never fails to be as good as his word. God is so true that, that the witnesses of angels would be suplicity. If my father were to make a statement, I certainly should not call on his servants to confirm it. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. The poor father in the scripture is challenged by Jesus' exhortation of faith. He did not believe in Jesus' power to deliver his boy. Uh, if he did not believe in Jesus' power to deliver this boy, uh, why else would he have come to Jesus? But he also recognizes his doubts. So he tearfully pleads with Jesus, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. How could the father ask for greater faith if there was none to begin with? The father's belief was not a rejection or rebellion of faith, but rather a response to our human condition. How can I touch and feel faith? Lord, help me with my doubt. Then Jesus sees the crowds coming near. Now this is interesting. As he sees the, the, the crowds coming near, Jesus could, could, could wait a moment and he could free this child in front of all these witnesses, right? I mean, he could do this in front of everybody. And, and, and he, could, he could say, in your face, to the scribes. And, and, and he, could, he could give uh, uh, encouragement to his disciples. And he could say, see, God is the God of all. God has the true authority. Man, he could be a rock star if he just waits a moment and lets the crowd assemble. But instead, Jesus moves quickly before the crowd can form. Why? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. If I only have faith because I witness this healing, then the next time that I hoped for a healing that did not happen, would my faith remain? Does that make sense? If my faith is limited to the good things and, 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 and cool things that, that Jesus accomplishes, then Jesus is little better than a sideshow at a circus. Amaze me, God. Keep me interested. No, faith is about our belief in that which we know, which we can experience but we cannot touch and feel and physically see. If our faith is mature, our confidence comes from the spirit, not from the flesh. Jesus commands, you deaf mute spirit, come out. The spirit tries to hang on, but God's power is infinite. And then when the demon leaves, the child appears deceased. Did this demon win in the end? Jesus takes the child by the hand and returns him to his father. Theologian Matthew Poole, speaking of the demon, said, He will do what harm he can when he cannot do to us the harm that he would. When they had separated from the crowds and gone indoors, the disciples inquired, Why could we not overcome this demon. See, we remember when Jesus first called his disciples, 
uh, he gave them authority over demons in Mark chapter 3. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that they might send, he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. I'm sure the disciples are ashamed. First they could not do it. Then they were mocked by the scribes. And then, of course, Jesus comes up and makes it look, e makes it look easy. Jesus, why could we not do this? This kind can only come out in prayer. It isn't that prayer makes us more worthy to cast out demons. It is that prayer and fasting draw us closer to the heart of God. And they put us more in line with his power and his godly desires. They are an expression of our total dependence upon him. Theologian Warren Worsby, the authority that Jesus had given them to drive out demons was effective only if exercised by faith. But faith must be cultivated through spiritual discipline and devotion. If our prayer life is limited to and consumed by the stuff that we desire. Okay? Oh no, I've got a problem with my vehicle. Lord of holy healing. Oh no, uh, I'm having trouble at work. Lord, smite that person. Oh Lord... Um, please be with my neighbor who's ill. But if we don't have the spiritual discipline of prayer, and if we don't have the spiritual discipline of seeking God's word and working to understand what God is saying to us, because the word is living, it was spoken at a specific time in a specific place to a specific people about a specific incident or issue. Does that make sense? That's true, the way it was written. But the way and the reason it's a living document is because those truths are eternal. The human condition has not overcome its baser challenges. Greed, sex, pride. They're all still evident, aren't they? And so that means that that truth still speaks into our world today. But if we don't seek to understand and read it, how can we hope within it? How can I truly have hope other than I hope my wife makes pot roast tonight? You know what I mean? If I don't happen to mention it to her, I'm going to end up with tacos, which is okay, but I'm in the mood for pot roast. Y'all understand what I'm saying here. I, I, I want to make sure I articulate this well. If our prayer life resembles a stopping at the restaurant and making an order to a, to, to a short order cook, I would like my neighbor healed over easy, a side of fix my truck, and you know while you're at it, a little world peace. Amen. If a stranger came up to you and asked you for pot roast, would you find that odd? If the kids came over for dinner and said, we hope we have pot roast, isn't that cool? It's about relationships. How can we treat Jesus as a short order cook as opposed to a beloved member of family? Did I do something? I'll just talk louder until we, oh, we're back. <laughs> Think of the people you know best that are the most comfortable with. You ever meet those, those couples that like finish each other's sentences? Okay, how many of you know people like that? Aren't they annoying? Seriously, okay? <clears throat> how do they get that in tune? As you think about the people you know best, the most comfortable with, how did that come to be? Well, you seek out quality time to talk to each other, to share dreams and goals and the struggles of, of life and our life stories. This is how we create a relationship <clears throat> of value, trust, and intimacy. Is there another way? If there is, I don't know what it is. 
we have to invest in each other to be deeply in relationship with each other. Is that fair? God has already shared with us God's goals, God's desires, God's, God's love story with humanity through Scripture. Have we invested ourselves the same with God? An intimate relationship with God is worth more than a prayer. It's trust. It's accountability. It's knowing that living to be right with God is the best life we can hope for. Total dependence on God is the remedy for many spiritual problems. To be disappointed in yourself is when you must acknowledge that you've only trusted yourself. Theologian Matthew Henry. Uh, Matthew Henry is a theologian back in uh, all the, the early 1800s. So the language is really, really kind of, it's older and it's beautiful. Uh, so he's not quoted much anymore, but I happen to love Matthew Henry. Christ will have him, speaking of the father of the possessed child, reckon the disappointment to the want of faith. Very much is promised to our believing. If thou canst believe, it is possible that thy hard heart may be softened, thy spiritual diseases may be cured, and weak as thou art, thou mayest be able to hold out to the end. We worship an awesome God. We worship a God who is creator. We worship a God of grace and mercy. We author a God who is the author of all good things like life and love and fellowship and football and ducks, geese. We worship a God who is a redeemer, who reaches out to us in our brokenness to bring us near. He calls us friend. We worship a God who is our father as we are children of God. We worship a God of action for our well-being, a God who accepts us in our sin and brokenness and pays the final price for our shame so that we may be with him for eternity. I like the way theologian G. Campbell Morgan describes Jesus' actions as he walked into this, this story revealed in our scripture today. He says, he found disputing scribes, a distracted father, a demon-possessed boy, and defeated disciples. He silenced the scribes, he comforted the father, he healed the boy, and he instructed the disciples. This is the Savior we worship this is the Redeemer we draw near to in prayer. Why do we not do so more? Y'all, I've said this a hundred times, and I'll keep saying it until it quits being true. The creator of the world has given in to you. I've lost you again, haven't I? There we go. The creator of the world has given us an opportunity to know God. We know God because we have his scripture. We can see, see the way that God loves. We can see the way that God calls us to live. We can see the way that God calls us to be in re relationship with God and with each other. We see the, 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 the depth of this love goes beyond creation, goes beyond surrounding us with the abilities uh, with, with the resources with which we can thrive, but this is a God who gives up of himself so that we can be in eternal relationship with God. We worship a God who is complete, whose love is full. Here, know me, he says. Here is my scripture. How can we not read it daily, over and over and over again. As I said before, I've, I've taught this scripture many times, but it was only this time that I have a new revelation of a healing versus a, a demon possession. It's living, and God will continue to teach us as we read even the same scriptures again and again and again. Why do we not do that? How can we not be interested in being in relationship with the creator of all things, including the author of love and life. How can we not be in relationship 
in prayer. If I have a really good day, I'm going to call my friend Keith, Pastor Keith in Delhi. We've been friends for many, many years. And when something really cool happens, I call him. In fact, I hate to admit it to you, but we're like teenage girls. We talk to each other four or five times a day, okay? Man, this just happened, okay? If I'll reach out to Keith to share the good news of my life, why do I not reach out to God? If I reach out to Keith to share uh, uh, something that I'm struggling with or something that broke my heart, why would I not reach out to God? I love my friend Keith. But he is not the creator of all things, the perfecter of love and life. Why do I spend more time with him, perhaps, than I do with God? People, we have an amazing invitation to be in relationship with the creator of all things. Why do we not open that door more often? Amen. Y'all, I have a video for you. And I've been told that when they show this on tape, um, the videos don't always show up, show up. So this video is Raise a Hallelujah by Bethel Music. And uh, you can uh, check it out on YouTube if it doesn't show up on the tape. I raise a hallelujah The presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise. Hallelujah. 
the midst of the pandemic, many churches are using YouTube videos in their worship service. Um, we do have the proper licensing to do that, but not all of them do. And what they have done is um, they can't keep up, so they've gone with, unless you have mailed them their license or something, I think Michael's checking on it, um, they don't always let you use their videos. So I want you to know we are legal, but we'll be announcing the videos from here on. Um, now we come to a time when we start uh, to look at how the church is supported so that we can speak God's truth into this unique time, in these unique situations, unique place. And so we come to the time to remind you of the offering. I have a special request for you. Um, we have a, 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 a woman who is attached to the church. She's been here ever since I've been here, shortly after I got here. She, um, uh, her health is such that uh, I'm not comfortable asking to share her name because um, I'm not sure she would understand what I was asking. So I will not be able to share her name, but I think from the circumstances, most of you, or many of you might know who I'm talking about. She usually sits right there. Um, she, uh, she has MS, she has Parkinson's, and she has another something that I can't pronounce. And the odds of these three, three things coming together, she like won the bad health lottery. And it's just really terrible. And she is in a very bad place. Her family is, is uh, not well to do by any means. Um, they just get by. And her greatest angst is how her family is gonna take care of her, her death and, and funeral expenses. The church, uh, many, many years ago, was given five burial plots. Through the years, we've given away, I believe, three of them. There's two left uh, over here at the funeral, or at the cemetery right over here. Um, and so we are prepared to give her one of those burial plots to help with the expenses. Uh, the county, I've met with uh, Brian Muller. Uh, the county is going to pay the lion's share of her service, but it's going to leave some left over and the family's not going to have it. Um, Brian has agreed with us that uh, we're gonna split it. He's gonna match whatever we can come up with. Um, we're looking for no more than $1,500. It might be as little as 1,000. We're not really sure how that's all gonna transpire because the family does have some choices to make. Um, so I'm asking, uh, just as a free will offering, a love offering, um, if you uh, could maybe throw in a little bit to help raise money for this lady's end of life expenses. I told her we were going to take care of this for her. From one way or another, we're going to handle this um, so that she could have peace because it was causing her enormous anxiety at a time when she should be investing in her young children. So um, uh, just think about that. Um, uh, if you would like to mark a check in the, in the little box down there, just put funeral expenses, something like that, so that the counters will know to put it into a special place. That would be great. But I'm sure that we can, we can take care of this. Okay. Um, so the offering plates are here at the back doors as you're walking out, and they're also at the back doors on your way out. And now let's enter into my favorite time of worship when we come together and prayer and share the stuff of our families. Um, continued prayers for Tom Allen, whose surgery is, what is today? Next, a week, a week and a half from now. Um, Denise Deppey, Wilbur, Wilbur and Evelyn Everts, Larry Gorenson, whose surgery is October 5th, yes. Um, well, you know, let's just do this now, shall we? Let's pray. I'd touch you if I could, Larry. Holy loving God, we ask you please to be with Larry as he goes forward in his surgery. Lord, we pray for encouragement and peace. Let him boldly go forth. We know that any kind of back surgery is risky. So Lord, we ask you to be with the doctors and nurses and all who provide care. And, and Lord, just a double portion of healing grace. Let his healing amaze and astound all who are involved and let them know that you are near. And Lord, we ask you please to be with his family and all who love him in encouragement and also in peace, knowing that we lay this at your feet of the cross. Lord, we love you. Amen. Um, 
Tammy Ruff, pencil. Uh, Danielle Nelson, Susan Rogers. Uh, Tim Tutton, who's home, doing well. Brooklyn Weifel. Um, we have a new one this morning, Jean, Jen Hubner, who is Linda Tom's granddaughter and has just been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she has started her new first teaching job uh, a few weeks ago. Mary Bissell, Chris Jackson, Ellen Nistel, Tanya Smith, Troy and Lisa Tutton, Dean Weifel, Jim DeKeyser, Terry Dolan, Zach Fisher, Jeff Larson, um, uh, Ken, uh, oh my Lord, Mary Jo's husband, Chris Larson, thank you, uh, is in the hospital after surgery. I've been able to talk to him. Let's also add him in prayer. John Rasmussen, Donna Tenoff, um, it's, it's drawing near. Uh, her time here is, is, is coming very short. Let us keep her in, in a double portion of prayer. Uh, Bill Welcher, and of course, uh, the 11 Good, na good Neighbor Home residents uh, that were tested positive with COVID. May it end there, praise, please, God, um, and uh, let them all recover well. Oh, and I heard a rumor, can anybody confirm, did Doc Terrell fall and hurt himself? I heard that Doc fell and hurt himself, so let us keep Doc in prayer as well. Others? Yes? The who family? Prophet. Crawfel. Okay, the Crawfel family. It's been eight years since they lost their son. Been eight years since they lost their son. Yeah. Boy, that's tough. Others? Yes. She just lost a sense of smell, yeah. but she's doing fine. And the 10 of you that went into quarantine? Oh, well, praise God that everybody's well. Praise God. Others? Did you want to mention? Yeah. Um, a friend of Debbie's at work, her name's Cindy. Um, her son's name is? Alex. Um, Wednesday, he went into the hospital not feeling well. Friday, they put him in intensive care, and Saturday, he passed away, and they're just not sure why yet. Um, so let us be with Cindy and her family in prayer. Others? Yes? Matthew, can you pull that off? And I hear your prayer. It's, uh, the students of West Delaware that are um, testing positive, that's starting to make its rounds at school, um, it's only a teenager who'd say the greatest concern is their home with no one to talk to. If it's okay with you, I'm going to pray that their health, uh, for their health as well. Um, but uh, thank you, Matthew. Others? Y'all, let's pray, shall we? Holy and loving God, we ask you, please, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for all those that we have listed, those that we know of, Lord, those who are seeking to know you in, in times of crisis, be it health or financial or whatever. Lord, be made known. Lord, we ask you, please, to be with our young people, our students right now. Lord, this is overwhelming to, the, to those of us who have more life experiences, have more abilities of coping. Lord, for our young people, I, I ask you to just be made known and let them know that we can trust you. And Lord, for those who are coming to an end of life here in this place, Lord, we know in their faith that their eternity is fixed and shall be amazing in your presence. But for those of us who will be left behind, Lord, we shall miss them. And in our humanness, there is our fear of death. Lord, help us with our unbelief. 
bring us comfort. Lord, we just ask you to be with all those who are seeking to know you this day. And if it be your will, guide our steps so that we can somehow engage with them to speak of your love story with, with humanity so that they too can hear and believe. Lord, we love you. Amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn. Oh, the Lord's Prayer. Let's start there. And Lord, for those moments when our memories catch up with our age, we ask you to help us to pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, Lord. Amen. I have to say something before we can run out. You have to come up here. Okay. Rex is ready to lead me out. Y'all, what a wonderful morning of worship. I did forget to mention something in prayer time. Um, Wayne, uh, I want to make sure I get the last name right. <clears throat> Birkenholtz. Uh, he is going to be baptized and join the church uh, at uh, the 10 o'clock service. So let us keep him in prayer and celebration. Y'all, let's pray, shall we? Holy and loving God, we thank you for this time you've given us to be here together in this place and to just share in your holy word and music and prayer. Lord, we ask you to lift us up this week. Let us live as a people encouraged by your truth. Let us live as a people in joy of, 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 of your promise. Lord, let us live as a people of a witness of a better way so that others will see, experience, and believe. Lord, the prayer of our heart is that you will create in us to be vessels of your spirit, so that others will experience you loving them through us and say there is something truly special about Jesus. Oh, Lord, let them hunger to know you more. We love you. Amen. Amen.